All right. Can you guys hear me okay? Awesome. Yes. Thank you. So um, welcome to our rural education series. Um, I'm Andra Farkas. I'm one of the EMS docs at University of Colorado. Um, and thank you guys for joining. Just a brief reminder to please email Ryan Shelton and his email is there and I'll pop it again um, on the screen to get your CE. We are gonna record this application for later use and I have my chat up so that I can see you guys. Um, and if I can ask everybody to uh, mute unless they are speaking, that would be awesome. Okay, let's get started. So a uh, brief disclosure before we start this talk is that, I, oh, someone's drawn on the screen. Um, I am not a cardiologist. Uh, the goal is this talk is not to go into the very nitty gritty um, of uh, specific EKG things. Um, I am not gonna break out calipers and measure QRSs. I'm not gonna cover some rare obscure rhythms that you're never gonna see. Um, I am in fact an emergency medicine and EMS physician, right? So this is kind of how my simple ED doc brain thinks about some high yield uh, cardiac arrhythmias, especially out in the field where, you know, you're not gonna have um, a lot of support and a lot of resources. Um, I am gonna turn my camera off for this because my computer likes to really slow down when um, the camera is on. And... Give me one second here. I don't know how to undo the drawings. If anybody knows how to do that, if you want to put it in the chat. Um, otherwise, we are going to have to look at these red lines for the rest of the talk. All right, so let's jump right in. Um, what are we going to do today? We're going to review some relevant anatomy and physiology. Um, we are going to identify some various arrhythmias. We're going to talk about their general management. And we're going to practice some case-based management of arrhythmias. And uh, at the end, we're going to talk a little bit about future uh, lectures as part of this series, the Rural EMS series. And we'll also talk about um, Skills of Palooza for those of you who signed up for this weekend. Um, we'll go a little bit uh, some information. So let's jump right in. It is going to be a little bit boring at first. Um, it's, you know, we just kind of have to get everybody on the same page. We have different folks from different levels, um, different agencies, different levels of practice, and so different levels of experience, et cetera. So we're just going to start with the basics to kind of get everybody on the same page. It's not going to be exciting, but then once we get through that, it'll be a little bit better, I promise. And, you know, I think we can all use a little bit of a basic refresher once in a while anyways, right? I actually learned a bit uh, making this talk um, just on the basics. So we're gonna briefly start with uh, anatomy and physiology review. And I'm talking brief, like two slides brief. So this is the heart, right? Up here, you have the atria. Down here, you have the ventricles, right? A brief overview of how the electrical pathway works. So electrical signals, remember, start at the top of the heart, right here in the sinoatrial node, right? Once this little guy gets a little impulse to, to fire, um, the impulse travels down and both has the uh, right and left atria squeeze, but also travels down to the atrioventricular node, right? Like it is named, it is between the atria and the ventricles. Um, this guy fires, sends it down the, uh, the middle and basically powers both of the ventricles to squeeze, right? This is the very basic pathway of cardiac electricity. Um, a little bit as to how that correlates to an EKG, which, you know, I have to say is probably one of the best inventions for pre-hospital care. It helps us do a lot. Um, but uh, basically, it starts up here, right, SA node. We start to see this little segment come in. Okay, great. The atria beat, uh, squeeze, excuse me, and as you know, that is the P wave. So making some progress there. Once we kind of start to transition down into the ventricles is when you start to get the QRS complex. And the, really the bulk of the QRS complex is the ventricle squeezing, pushing blood forward. And then the rest of it, um, we won't talk about in much detail, but it's repolarizing of the ventricles is the T wave. And then we kind of do it all over again, right? 60 to 100 times a minute. Um, that is just the basic, how this correlates to an EKG. All right, see, that wasn't that bad. All right, we are going to talk about some very uh, basic rhythm recognition. Let's start with an easy one. 
normal sinus rhythm, right? Um, usually rates 60 to 100 is what's considered normal. And this one's very straightforward. There's a P wave and it's upright, meaning it's pointing up, right? And there's one before every QRS. And then there is a QRS after every P, right? So every P leads to a QRS and then over and over and over again. It's pretty regular. The times here, the little intervals are pretty regular. Um, this is normal sinus rhythm, right? The easy one. All right. But, but what if it's not, right? If it's abnormal, if it's not easy. Oh, hold on one second. Small green pencil at the lower left side. Mm, hang tight, guys. Thank you, Becky. Awesome. That's better, huh? Um, all right. So the first thing you are asking yourself when you notice um, that something is not normal sinus rhythm is if it's too fast or too slow, right? Again, going back to the basics, too fast, too slow. Can you guys hear me? Okay. Some one person says they have no sound. Can someone give me a thumbs up or I can hear you. Okay. I can hear you, Andrea. Okay. Uh, John, I'm sorry. I don't know why you don't have sound. <laughs> okay. Um, so when it's not normal sinus rhythm, like I said, we ask ourselves, is it too fast or too slow? If it's too slow, let's start with an easy one. Sinus bradycardia, right? What does this mean? It is the same thing we just went over, right? With the P wave before every QRS, QRS after every P, but it's slow. It's less than 60. It's the exact same pattern, but it's just slower rate. Pretty straightforward. Then we get into the AV blocks, right? These were super challenging for me when I was first learning. Um, it can be very confusing sometimes, but there's first degree, there's second degree, and third degree. And what is an AV block? It is when the sinoatrial node, like we said, this starts the whole process, is firing. The sinoatrial node is trying to get the heart to beat in its regular automaticity, right? But the AV node just says no, nope, either completely um, and will not let any electricity pass through, or it just is a little sluggish, kind of moving things a little bit more slowly, right? So that is the basic AV block pathology. Now. The first degree is when there's just a little bit of a delay through the AV node. So the QRS comes every time, but it's just a little bit slow. You see that between the P and the QRS here, it's a little bit longer, right? This is generally not a big deal and don't actually really do anything about it. Um, they don't often uh, treat this in any way, put pacemakers or anything like that, um, unless it's obviously super symptomatic, but nobody's really gonna have symptoms with this. Pretty straightforward. The second degree is when it starts to get a little bit more tricky. So there's two types of second degree. Um, there's type one and type two, and they have some fun names that we won't go into. But um, type one is where the PR, so between the P and the QRS here, starts to get longer and longer and longer until finally a beat just drops. This P wave doesn't, oops, this P wave doesn't conduct to a uh, QRS, and then it starts kind of all over again. This is a little less ideal than the first degree, right? A little bit more dangerous. Um, if you're symptomatic or older, usually above the age of like 45, 50, you are probably going to get a pacemaker for this, right? This isn't a great thing to have. Now, when you're talking about type two, this is far more severe. And this is basically just random dropping of beats, right? Some of them conduct, some of them don't. Seems pretty random. This person will definitely need a pacemaker in the long term. And then finally, the third degree, this is the bad one, right? This is when the SA node is trying to fire and the AV node blocks everything completely. So a secondary pacemaker takes over, whether that's another node in the ventricles or um, uh, somewhere higher up, right? The communication is completely broken here. Um, and there's, you know, what we call marching out, right? So the P waves are marching out to the same rhythm and then the QRSs are marching out, but they are both playing to the tune of their own songs, right? They are not playing the same song. So this is someone that you're definitely going to need a pacemaker for. So nothing groundbreaking here about adult bradycardia algorithm, and I'm not going to go through this. This is the ACLS basic, and we'll talk about it more in the cases. Uh, but basically, 
overview, right? Obviously your first move is gonna be ABCs and then sick or not sick, right? Um, if they uh, have symptoms or are sick, then you're gonna treat it either with medications or electricity, right? And we'll talk about that a little bit more about the details. And there's certainly a lot of other slow rhythms that are um, a lot more that we could go through, but for the sake of having an hour and a half, they're far beyond the scope of this talk. So we'll just focus on this one. Any questions about the slow ones before we go on to the two fast ones? All righty. So what if it's too fast? When you are thinking about too fast, you think about one thing primarily. Is the QRS narrow or is the QRS wide, right? Is it like this or is it like this? What is the duration that separates and defines narrow from wide? Can someone uh, pop it in the chat or unmute? Anybody? How many milliseconds are we talking about? 120, awesome, thank you, exactly. Dr. Wright, you don't get the answer. I know, you know. Um, all right, so let's talk about when the QRS is uh, narrow. What we ask ourselves next is, is it regular or irregular? Meaning are the QRS is beating at a regular rate um, or are they kind of all over the place? When we go back to wide, we kind of ask ourselves the same question, right? Is it regular or irregular? So let's talk about QRS narrow. Couple of things for tachycardia with a narrow QRS and regular. Big things to highlight are sinus tachycardia, supraventricular tachycardia, and atrial flutter, okay? Sinus tachycardia, again, same thing where it's sinus rhythm. P before every QRS, QRS after every P. It's just fast. It's faster than 120. Um, pretty straightforward for that one. SVT is um, a supraventricular tachycardia, which is, again, generally greater than 100. But if you look at this strip here, you see you don't see any P waves, right? What's happening is that the sinus node is firing, but there's this re-entry circuit that kind of keeps going back and forth and makes the heart basically just keep firing um, and beating pretty fast. So that's SVT. Big thing is you don't see any P waves. It's pretty regular, but you're not going to see any Ps. And then finally for narrow and regular is atrial flutter. Um, it's narrow if it's a um, time conduction, right? So you can have different rates of conduction, like a two to one or four to one, et cetera, which means how many P waves do you have before one of them uh, makes the ventricles beat and you get a QRS, right? So here you have P, P, then you have a QRS, then you have a T wave. So it's a two to one. That's basically what it is. And if it is something like this, it can look very regular. And sometimes these nice, sawtooth waves um, don't always appear. They can be a little bit hidden, and a little bit tricky to find. So this could be a tricky arrhythmia to diagnose. And basically what's happening is it's just a re-entry circuit here also um, that is making the atria do that. All right, what if it's irregular? So with an aerocurus, we have atrial fibrillation or we can have the flutter that we just talked about, but it's with variable conduction, meaning it's not scheduled like a two to one or a four to one or what have you, it's all over the place. Atrial fibrillation, really the big point about this, right, is that it's irregularly irregular, right? So a lot of the management and stuff that we're gonna talk about is certainly ALS level, um, but a lot of the basic concepts that we're gonna focus on are really for all of us, right? So when you are, worried about atrial fibrillation, you're feeling a pulse. If it is beating all over the place and it does not make any sense as to how it's beating, then that is likely atrial fibrillation, right? Irregularly irregular. And that's basically what this atria is doing is fibrillating um, and not beating in a consistent, organized way. And then finally, for narrow QRS and irregular is atrial flutter with variable conduction, like I was saying. You can see you have some waves here. You have a couple, you have a P, a QRS, a P QRS. Then you have maybe a couple of other more P's before you get a QRS. And again, it's just kind of all over the place um, with the atria. All right, those are the easy ones. Now, if it's not normal sinus rhythm and it is too fast and the QRS is wide, 
Theoretically, we're supposed to ask ourselves if it's regular or irregular, right? But do I really care if it's regular or irregular? Not really, right? QRS being wide tachycardia is going to scare you and you're going to want to do this, right? This is one of my favorite memes, by the way, you're going to see this used multiple times. Um, but, you know, if it's if it's QRS wide, yeah, you can look at it if it's regular or irregular, but most likely you're going to act on it, right? Without having time to kind of look at it in a lot of detail. So if the QRS is wide, it's ventricular tachycardia until proven otherwise. Maybe some type of rhythm that comes from the atria that has aberrancy or a bundle branch block, but more likely probably still ventricular tachycardia, right? And what the aberrancy means is that there can be some rhythms that come from the atria that uh, the electrical impulse is really conducted abnormally through the ventricle, so it makes that QRS look wide. These are certainly less dangerous than ventricular tachycardia, but it's really hard to tell um, a lot of the time if it is this or if it's VTAC. So VTAC, monomorphic, um, just means that it's pretty regular, right? You can see it's a wide QRS, it's regular, it's fast. And what's happening is this electrical circuit in the ventricles are just going again and again, right? On the other hand, you can also have polymorphic. Can someone tell me what this is called and how you treat it? You want to pop it in the chat for me? What is the name for this type of rhythm? Torsades. Yeah, perfect. How do you treat it? Magnesium. Oh, beautiful. Exactly. And then, um, and we'll talk about torsades more later. And then the other thing you can have is a supraventricular tachycardia, right? So something coming above from above the ventricles is what I mean by this, not specifically SVT, but just something coming from above that has a weird conduction, right? So as you can see, if you just saw this, this looks pretty wide and scary and VTACky, right? Um, maybe if you got the full 12 lead, you could tell between the two. But here, if you just see that strip, this is going to look like VTAC. And how do you really tell between something like this, where it's a um, atrial arrhythmia with aberrancy and VTAC? Well, unfortunately, it's kind of hard, right? And this first quote is from like a emergency medicine blog. Um, it is actually a lot of the time difficult to tell between the two. It's not always possible. There's certain things you can measure, like the QRS and which way the R wave is pointing and everything else. But that is a little bit beyond the scope of this talk. Um, but in general, it's hard to tell. Um, and then the other complicating factor is that a lot of research has shown that if you have a wide complex tachycardia, um, it's most likely VTAC, like 80% of them are VTAC. So the big takeaway is if it looks like VTAC, it's probably VTAC and you should treat it like VTAC because VTAC is worse than the other thing it could be. So the big tachycardia algorithm, again, we're not gonna go through this in detail and um, we'll talk about it through the cases, but it's the same thing, right? You're either gonna treat with medication or electricity based on how stable they are. You obviously are always gonna start with your ABCs. You're gonna look for underlying causes, et cetera. And then just for fun, since it is the season uh, and it's getting to be that time of year um, to be scared, let's briefly talk about one last scary thing. What is this top rhythm? Refib. Yeah. Is this person going to have a pulse? No, they're not. And then down here, asystole, right? Um, we won't talk about cardiac arrest today. That's not the scope of the talk, but um, just, you know, figure we'd round out the whole thing and talk about those two. All right. You guys made it through the basics, and we're going to jump into cases. Does anybody have any questions, anything I wasn't clear on? before we hop on. And then the other thing is, um, this part really requires audience participation. So please, please, please type in the chat, unmute, um, whatever your preferred way is. Um, I'm not afraid of awkward silence and I will awkward silence once somebody answers. All right, take that as no questions. Let's jump into case one. So you have a 67 year old male who's lightheaded. Obviously, this is an arrhythmia talk. You're thinking about all the arrhythmias it could possibly be. What else could be going on, though, right? This is a very non-specific chief complaint. Give me some other things that you're thinking about as you're driving to this call. 
low blood sugar. Love it. Intoxication. Absolutely. Dehydration in the chat. Yep. Hypotension. Absolutely. Hypoxia. Yes. All of the vital sign, all of the hypos and hypers could be causing this. Exactly. You show up. This is your first impression. You walk into the house and he's sitting up. He's speaking. He's not in any respiratory distress. It's a little bit diaphoretic, which, you know, we don't love to see that. But otherwise, ABC seems to be okay right now. He says he started a few minutes before calling the lightheadedness specifically. But then he tells you he's had chest pain off and on for a couple of days. You know, he's been, you know, working around his house, haven't really paid attention. Really, his wife called 911, let's be honest. Um, and then he tells you he has hypertension and diabetes. You get a first set of battles, which I know you're all going to. And you see his heart rate is 190. His blood pressure is 120 over 80. He is breathing about 20 times a minute and setting about 92% over there. What do you do? What's next? What's your next move on this patient? Sick or not sick? Sick. Yeah. With that heart rate of 190, he's maintaining his blood pressures, right? Which is good, but certainly 190 is sick. Um, I see 12 lead in the chat. I see oxygen, which I love. Get him on the monitor. Absolutely. Um, vagal, potentially. We'll talk about that. Um, IV access, perfect. Exactly. You guys got it all. Um, you could check a glucose too, right? But he's awake. He's talking to you. Probably hypoglycemia isn't causing a heart rate of 190. There's probably something else going on. Um, but all of those things are absolutely appropriate. This is ZKG. What is this? What rhythm is it specifically? VTEC? Yeah, absolutely. It is fast. It is, um, remember our algorithm, right? So it's not normal sinus, it's fast. And the QRS is definitely wide. And if the QRS is wide, it's VTAC, 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 maybe something else VTAC, right? So exactly, VTAC. What's your next move with this patient? So this guy's heart rate is 190. His blood pressures are okay for now. What are you doing next? Deep it pads, yes, love it. Put the pads on the patient in case something changes. You guys, you have an IV already. You gave him oxygen already. Pads are low to go. Yeah, get out of there. Meds. Okay. What meds are you thinking, Kimberly? Amiodarone. Beautiful. Yeah. So ABCs, certainly. IV. Consider oxygen, give him oxygen, really, he's 92. Uh, put him on the monitor, put the pads on. And then an antiarrhythmic. Um, certainly there's a lot of people from a lot of different agencies here. And so I will defer to your agency's protocol, but most of the time we tend to use amiodarone. Um, this would be a dose of um, 150, right? Not the cardiac 300, cardiac arrest dose 300, but it'd be a dose of 150. Um, some systems still have lidocaine. Um, some data shows amiodarone is better, but obviously defer to your protocols for VTAC, whether you have to call it in or not. Um, some systems you have to call into base if they're stable, et cetera. But absolutely an antiarrhythmic and pads on in case he decompensates. Now, you are 40 minutes away from your nearest facility by ground. Um, do you drive or do you fly? What would you guys do in your system usually for this patient? Drive. Becky's bold. She's doing it. <laughs> All right. Um, yeah, so some some would drive, some would fly, right? And then I saw a comment about vols, uh, vagal maneuvers uh, being interesting. So vagal maneuvers certainly do not have a role in this, in VTAC right, uh, management, but um, 
actually like 20, I, I don't, don't quote me on this, but a certain number of them do actually convert with Vagel. Please don't do Vagels on VTAX. That is not the way we manage this. But um, I was looking this up recently and some of them do actually convert with Vagel maneuvers, which is kind of mind blowing. Very little amount. Um, and again, not indicated, but yeah. So maybe let's say in our system right now that we're in, it's bad weather. So you can't fly. So you're, you have to drive, right? Still this on the monitor, despite the amiodarone, despite everything else you've done. Um, but now his blood pressure is 70 over 40 and he's a little bit sleepier. What are you gonna do with this patient now? Drive faster. A nice cardiovert. Yeah, absolutely. Cardiovert, exactly. And drive faster, both of those things. Synchronized, yes, thank you, exactly. So synchronized cardio version. Good thing you guys had the pads on, ready to go. Um, important uh, and uh, Edison before medicine. <laughs> I like that. Um, so actually, if you do have time and if your protocols allow, be nice to your patients. Give them some type of medications before you um, shock them. Certainly, if you again, if the blood pressure and your system allows. Um, give them some benzodiazepines or something. Uh, but yeah, electricity is the way to fix this and synchronized cardioversion is the way to fix this um, because this patient has a pulse. This is VTAC with a pulse. If you lost the pulse, we'd certainly go to defibrillation, but this patient has a pulse, so you're gonna synchronize cardiovert. All right, so you synchronize cardiovert him, you'll fix him, he's in sinus on the monitor. What do you wanna do after that? You're still driving, still heading to the hospital. Check a pulse. Yep, he has a pulse. He's chatting. Blood pressure. Blood pressure, reassess. Yep, repeat vitals. Any specific diagnostic thing you want to do? Ooh, amio drip. Yes, yes. Repeat 12 lead. Yes, that is exactly what I was trying to get to. Um, what and this is his repeat 12 lead. This isn't subtle. What's going on here? Sammy. Yeah, he has a pretty obvious STEMI, right? Um, so the reason why uh, I wanted to point that out is that a lot of the time, um, the most common cause of ventricular tachycardia is some type of underlying ischemic heart disease, right? Um, in the presence of acute coronary syndrome, actually it tends to be more polymorphic versus monomorphic, so more torsati, um, but certainly either one can happen um, in the context of an acute uh, injury to the heart, uh, like a ischemic injury to the heart, right? Um, also can happen with scars. So if someone had a heart attack, this guy's been having chest pain for three days, right? Maybe he actually had an end STEMI a couple of days ago. And, you know, he's now kind of doing some remodeling and some scarring and everything. And that's what triggered his ventricular tachycardia. Some other causes to consider, um, and actually, sorry, let me go back. And having ventricular tachycardia in a myocardial infarction or some type of acute uh, coronary syndrome actually is pretty bad and it increases, uh, predicts a higher risk of mortality, right? After an acute myocardial infarction. So definitely very sick patients. And this is why I harp on people that if you have a STEMI um, or sometimes, I mean, and STEMI might be a little pushing it in the hospital, but if you have a STEMI, put the pads on the patient, um, you know, because they can really devolve uh, quickly. Um, Blake, you'd like to know his cardiac history. He has hypertension and diabetes and um, just takes some, I don't know, metoprolol and metformin. He's never had a heart attack before. Good question though. Um, some other things that can cause um, ventricular tachycardia is structural heart disease, um, right? So kind of um, things that you're born with or acquired from uh, previous injuries to the heart of some kind. You can have cardiomyopathy, um, some congenital stuff, some um, et cetera. You can have inherited problems with the channels, um, right? The sodium channels and such in the heart that can cause lead to VTAC. You can have electrolyte imbalance, certainly potassium, magnesium, all of those things being out of whack can cause ventricular tachycardia and also substance use. Um, and a lot of medications as well um, can lead to uh, ventricular tachycardia. So just keep that differential in mind. Let's say... Instead of shock, like you didn't shock him, um, this is what he develops into. His vitals are stable though. This is the torsades we were talking about. You guys already identified what you would do here, um, that you would do magnesium. Um, and so I won't make you say it again, but um, brief aside on torsades. So this is polymorphic VTAC. 
basically what happens is the QT interval. So um, the, you know, the measurement between the Q wave and the T wave uh, basically gets prolonged. So this can happen either congenital. So you have, a, you're born with um, long QT syndrome or acquired from medications. Um, droperidol was a famous one that had a black box warning for QT prolonging for a while. Um, basically, this type of rhythm can either terminate spontaneously or it can lead into ventricular fibrillation. Um, so this is certainly not something to take lightly. Treatment, as you guys identified, if they're stable, you do magnesium. If they're unstable, you again, cardiovert synchronize much like you would do with um, monomorphic ventricular tachycardia. And then if they don't have a pulse, obviously you're going to defibrillate them. A couple of other things we can do in the hospital in the critical care space. Um, some flight teams um, can do this. You can do isoproteranol, which is basically um, a medication that increases your heart rate. And we usually go for 120. Um, and that's because torsades, this particular rhythm, um, really does well between 80 and 100. So you, you want to go up above that and basically either medically or electrically um, with overdrive pacing pace the patient out of that rhythm. Um, so that's kind of the, the big treatment for that. Some rural considerations, right, that we've touched on some of these. So, um, you know, are you going to fly this patient um, or is there going to be a prolonged transport? Are you going to be in the back of the ambulance with a VTAC um, for 45 minutes, right? Do Does the hospital that you're going to have a cath lab? Is this somebody that they can, you know, if he has a STEMI, you're probably going to need to maybe fly him out, right? Depending on your resources. Um, if he's going to the cath lab, can they, excuse me, can he go to the cath lab? Is he going to the hospital um, where they can put in a pacemaker or a ICD? Um, because that's what you're going to have to do for this patient, right? Um, if there's just two of you in the back or two of you on the unit, excuse me, and um, you're already driving and this patient that compensates, are you, do you have someone you can rendezvous with? Do you, can you get some additional resources, right? What if this patient codes on the way? There's just one person in the back. You're running a code by yourself, right? Um, can you rendezvous with an ALS unit or even a BLS unit that can be some additional hands? And then certainly the importance of monitoring, right? This is not somebody that you're going to sit back and do a Q15 minute vital sign and catch up on the crossword puzzle, right? This is somebody that you, it's a very dynamic presentation and you would just have to frequently reassess, 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 repeat uh, mental status and blood pressure and everything, pulse, et cetera, um, because this is a, a very sick patient with a lot of decompensation potential. Any questions on case one before we go on to case two? Awesome. All right. Case two starts the same way. 67-year-old male who's lightheaded. Um, again, same first impression, his sitting up speaking, not um, distressing in terms of respiratory status, um, just a little bit sweaty. Same story, started a couple minutes before calling, but he's had chest pain off and on for a couple days. Um, same past medical history, same medications. But this time, his vitals are a little bit different. His heart rate is 37. His blood pressure is the same, 120 over 80. His uh, respiratory rate is 20. O2 is 92%. What next? Probably going to do a lot of the same stuff we already talked about, right? Anything else you're thinking about? Is this guy sick or not sick? Mm -hmm. Sick. Heart rate of 37 is not great, right? Unless he's like Lance Armstrong, then heart at 37 is probably not ideal. <clears throat> yeah, we're on a 12 lead. Exactly. He's bradycardic. He's keeping his pressures up, at least. We have that going for us. This is his 12 lead. And you want to tell me what's going on? Some tiny little peas here. Hard to see. Yeah. Third, third degree heart block. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. I'm good. Come on. Awesome. Thank you. Oh, 
Okay. Um, yeah, what do you do next for this person in third degree heart block? So date and pace. Yeah. Do you try atropine? These blood pressures like 120s, right? Yeah, narrow narrow complex. Yeah, you can try all atropine, see what happens. You can try atropine, yeah. Um it probably won't work, right? You can absolutely try it. And you're right, the narrow complex you can, but it it's acting on the AV node, so it's not going to work, right? Um, if the patient's stable, it certainly won't harm them for trying it. But if there's even a whiff of instability, uh, pacing like you guys already identified um, will be the way to go, right? Because um, atropine uh, basically messes with the um, the AV node, like I said, right? But if it's already out completely, it's it works on the AV node, I should say. So if it's out completely, then it's not going to work. Yeah. So um, let's say, um, yeah, so pacing. We talked about pacing. You guys said you would consider pacing. So theoretically for ACLS, because he is stable, you could monitor this patient. However, in the rural context, right, how long is this guy going to actually be able to maintain a perfusing blood pressure with this heart rate? So as you guys very astutely identified, this person is going to need a little bit of sedation medication and pacing uh, because he's likely going to decompensate. If you're two minutes away from the hospital, fine. Put the pads on, get your IV access, do your ABCs, and you don't have to start pacing, right? But if you're 45 minutes away, this is certainly somebody that has really high decompensation potential. So pacing is absolutely an appropriate thing to consider. And then the other thing is, you know, can you fly this person out, right? Or are you going to have to drive? Because like I said, if it's a couple minutes, great. If it's longer, then you're going to have to deal with that person for a while. Let's say you're halfway through a prolonged transport. You haven't started pacing yet. Blood pressure goes low and he's sleepier. I'm not going to ask you guys what to do because you already identified it. You're going to have to pace this patient because now he has officially become hemodynamically unstable, right? Um, I won't go over the specific steps for how to do the transcutaneous pacing. Um, please follow your monitor um, instructions or protocols. Um, but like you already identified, please be nice. Consider, consider sedation if his blood pressure uh, will allow and your protocols allow uh, because it, it can be a little bit uncomfortable, right, to get paced. Um, just like Homer Simpson, um, you know, 80 times a minute or whatever you set it at. What are the ways that you can confirm that transcutaneous pacing is working? What do you need? Capture with the pulse. Capture with the pulse, right. Mechanical capture. And then what's the other capture? Um, I guess kind of both, right? So electrical capture and mechanical capture. If they're hypotensive, oh, okay. That's a uh, great question, uh, Dr. Wright. But I will uh, defer that to local protocols because I'm certainly not about to um, recommend sedation medications to people um, outside of their protocols. Um, so uh, electrical capture and mechanical capture. So electrical, right, you can see the spike of the pacer and then you see a QRS afterwards. Right. If you just see spikes and not a QRS afterwards, it means it's not working up, working yet, and you need to um, turn up the electricity a little bit. Mechanical capture, as you guys already identified, is actually feeling for a pulse and making sure that it coincides with the rate that you set. <laughs> Thank you, Ray. Yes, ketamine is what she was alluding to. Um, what if instead uh, of a 67 year old male, you had a seven month old male with these exact same heart rate, blood pressure's 50 over 30, breathing a little faster. You're probably thinking this, cause that's what I'm thinking, right? Like, uh, crap, um, CPR, absolutely. Um, so just to review, right? Obviously you guys know that these are very abnormal vitals for anybody, but infant, right? Heart rate is usually 100 to 190 when they're um, awake, uh, down to 90 when they're sleeping, and blood pressure is in the 70s at the lowest, right? Less than 70s hypotension. So this kiddo is bradycardic, 
hypotensive. Um, and respiratory rate's okay. We're doing okay with respiratory rate. Um, so you guys already um, nailed it, right? So um, CPR, this is the official ACLS recommendations. If a pediatric patient has bradycardia um, and any evidence of ultra mental status, signs of shock or hypotension, which this patient does, you can try to mess around with ABCs, right? Because, um, and by that I mean give them oxygen, help them ventilate. Because unlike adults, where a bradycardia is most likely to be a heart problem, in kids, it's most likely to be an oxygenation problem, right? So they recommend trying to assess and support these things. And if despite those, but don't obviously don't do it for too long, um, if despite that, the patient's heart rate is still less than 60, then you're going to start CPR. Um, so that was absolutely appropriate. And a diesel bolus. Um, thank you, Blake. Absolutely. Any questions on that case or comments? All right. Case number three is, again, deja vu, 67-year-old male, lightheaded. This time, though, he has slightly increased respiratory rate, and uh, he's still diaphoretic. He's still speaking. He's just breathing a little fast. Says it's been going on for a couple of days. Um, so not just started, but it's been going on for a couple of days. Got worse today. He's been kind of sick. Maybe a little bit of a fever. Maybe a little bit of a cough. Just not really feeling great. Same uh, past medical history. And then these are his, his vital signs. So heart rate's in the 150s. Blood pressure is 85 over 60. Breathing at 26 times a minute, maintaining his sets. What are you thinking? What's going on here? What's at the top of your list? What do you want to do? EGL, I like it. Sick, 12 lead fluids, yep. Oxygen, check the monitor, yep. Blood glucose is, I don't know, one time. It's fine. Good question. Yeah. So this is what his monitor looks like. Or excuse me, his 12 lead. What do you guys think about this? What is this? AFib, exactly. So it's irregularly irregular, right? Um, but yeah, that's pretty much it. It's AFib. Nailed it. But... What do you do? What do you want to know? Do you shock this guy? Is the AFib causing the low blood pressure? Fluid bolus, yep. Is it a primary heart problem? Is there something else going on? History of AFib, I love it. That was one of my... Top things that I want you guys, wanted you guys to ask. Um, he does not have a history of atrial fibrillation and he is not anticoagulated. Uh, anticoagulated. Fluids, as long as his lungs are clear, exactly. And they are, they're pretty clear. So you can give him some fluids. Yeah. So this case just serves as a reminder that um, sometimes the cardiac arrhythmia is not necessarily uh, primarily a heart problem, right? Sepsis specifically can lead to cardiac arrhythmias. And most commonly, actually, we see atrial fibrillation. Um, I've had countless patients that have never had AFib in their lives come in with sepsis and are now in atrial fibrillation. This is a compensatory thing, right? So blood pressure is low, you have a fever, you're sick, your heart's beating faster to compensate for the low blood pressure. And, you know, sometimes it, it leads into atrial fibrillation because of inflammatory cascades and everything else, right? Um, and a lot of patients, this is, like I said, the very first time that they've at least been diagnosed with AFib. Um, that, as far as we know, like no one's told them on an EKG or whatever that they've had AFib. And even after you treat the sepsis in the hospital, half of them will go on to keep having AFib after that. So once that pathway is set in place, um, it can keep happening. You're going to treat the underlying cause. So you're going to do supportive care, fluids, oxygen, as you guys um, already identified. The point of this case was really just using your critical thinking skills, right, at all levels, 
um, a provider to kind of parse this out. If you had shocked this patient, um, probably wouldn't have out, and it may have even hurt him, right? If you're taking away that compensatory mechanism that his body is doing to account for his hypotension, um, then um, you have to think about what is going on here, right? And also his heart rate's like 150s. Yeah, that's fast. But that's probably not what's causing a blood pressure in the 80s or if he continues to drop, right? So critical thinking, look at the whole picture um, as you guys already identified. Any questions about that before we go on to our last case? Cool. So this time, instead of a 67-year-old, you have a 27-year-old, but he has the same chief complaint, lightheaded. What are you thinking now in terms of this? A lot of the differentials are going to be the same, but what else in a 27-year-old, otherwise healthy, presumably person? Dehydrated, yep. Stimulants, yep, absolutely. Exactly. Yeah, definitely good things to think about. He tells you, um, sorry, you show up on scene, he is sitting up, speaking, no respiratory distress. He's not sweaty, he looks pretty good. He said it started just a few minutes before calling and it feels like his heart is racing. Doesn't have any chest pain. It's just kind of beating funny and racing. He has, he has no past medical history, but he was at a bachelor party this weekend. So he had a little bit to drink. That was, you know, like two days ago. Um, so he's not intoxicated now, but uh, had a little bit of alcohol, maybe wasn't exactly keeping up with his fluids. You got an EKG, yes. But his vital signs, his heart rate is 210. Blood pressure is okay, 120 over 80. Breathing 20 times a minute, setting 95%. Dehydration, certainly. 210, though, you'd have to be like a prune to get that high of a heart rate. Um, ask him about all the drugs he took this weekend. SVT, yeah. So you guys want an EKG. You're going to get an IV, right? Is this guy sick or not sick? Yeah, I mean, a heart rate of 210, that's not great, right? However, he's still looking okay. He is not sweaty, not hypotensive. He has huge sick potential, I agree. Uh, but you could maybe even argue, like, maybe he's okay. Let's see what's going on with his heart rate, right? We got to know that is a VTAC or is it SVT or something else. This is his 12 lead. What is this? Were you guys right? Was it SVT? Yeah, it's SVT, exactly. And uh, some of you already identified the next move, but um, you had mentioned vagal maneuvers. You certainly also want to get an IV, right? Consider oxygen on this guy. Certainly put him on the monitor and certainly put the pads on. Um, I don't care how good you look with a heart rate of 210, you deserve to have that, you know, those, uh, that, pad opened up and put on your chest um, because there's high decompensation potential here. Um, and then I see adenosine in the chat and someone that mentioned vagal maneuvers as well. Exactly. So talking about vagal maneuvers, um, Valsalva is kind of what we usually go to, right? Um, the standard Valsalva that we were taught a couple of years ago is, um, I think this is, let's pretend like this is a syringe, someone blowing into a syringe. Um, you blow into a syringe for 15 seconds and then they just kind of hang out there, right, for 45 seconds. The modified Valsalva, uh, which we started doing a couple of years ago, actually has a lot more success. It's successful a lot more often, which means you have to give adenosine um, a lot less frequently. Um, what you do is you still do the um, blowing into a syringe for 15 seconds, but then you lay them back. Obviously, if you know they're not trauma or not whatever, as, as best as you can, and if the patient condition will allow, you lay them back and tilt their legs up to about 45 degrees and you hang out there for another 15 seconds and then you uh, move them back up to a Fowler's or semi-Fowler's. 
And um, this is has a lot better success rate um, than the regular Valsalva. Um, yes, fluid bolus, I love it, absolutely. Um, you can theoretically do carotid sinus massage. However, and that's a big however, it is generally not recommended, um, especially if you are older, have any known carotid stenosis, um, you hear a brewy or they've had like a stroke or a TIA. A lot of this stuff, you're probably not going to be able to elicit from somebody, right? Especially if they're freaking out because their heart rate's 210. So, you know, obviously listen, follow your protocols. Um, but I don't do this. I do the Valsalva. I don't do carotid sinus and I don't massage and I don't know of too many providers that do. Um, but that is theoretically still a recommendation that you can try. All right, so you, it didn't work. Um, vitals are exactly the same. You guys already identified that the next step would be adenosine. Um, so, you know, the, the big point here is that if you're five minutes away um, and the patient's like, fine, not super symptomatic, you can certainly let it ride, right? If it's like a, literally you're right outside the ED doors. But, you know, if it's a longer transport, then you're probably going to want to um, convert this person, right? Because even if you're 27 and healthy, your heart rate can't be at 210 times a minute for 50 minutes without starting to get tired, right? So um, that is kind of like the rural extended transport consideration of this case is probably err on the side of um, trying to convert uh, before um, letting it ride. Um, the faster the action of laying them backwards has better outcomes. Um, I don't know specifically about how quickly you lay them down having better outcome. I don't know if there's data for that. Um, I do know that there's data for the modified Valsalva being better than the regular Valsalva, but I don't know if like how quickly or how soon you lay them back has, um, there's data to support that. But I mean, I, we have anecdotal data right now. Thank you. Um, for adenosine, be nice um, is really the motto of today's talk is be nice and warn your patients. Um, I don't know if you guys have had it uh, personally, but everybody says it just feels kind of terrible, right? Some people have like a kick to the chest. Some people have this dooming, I'm going to die sensation. Um, so be nice and warn them that this is going to happen, um, but also reassure them that it only lasts for a very short amount of time, right? Um, if you are going to push adenosine, have the pads on and have the patient on the monitor. Um, it is a safe medication, but it is certainly not without potential side effects, right? So um, have the pads on um, just in case something goes wrong. What it basically does, right, as we all know, is it basically just slows down the heart, right? It acts at the AV node, kind of terminates that, slows it down for a couple seconds. It's only a couple seconds, but, you know, if you've ever sat there and tried to give adenosine in an older patient, for example, and you watch the monitor and it's asystole and you're just like, okay, come on, come on. It can feel a lot longer, um, but um, it is very quick acting medication. Uh, rapid push is the way to do it because it does act so quickly. It also goes away very quickly. So you want to get it to the heart as quickly as possible. Um, I'm sure you guys know about this and have protocols for this, but you push it, you flush it, you lift the arm or you use a stopcock to really get that um, flush in quickly. Um, you can do six or 12, I'll defer to your protocol. Um, six works some of the time, 12 works better most of the time, uh, but that is adenosine. What if let's say you give adenosine and this is kind of what you notice um, during, cause you have the patient on the monitor. What is going on here? What is the actual underlying rhythm? Yeah, flutter, exactly. Um, atrial flutter, because, uh, and, and you know, you haven't harmed your patient, right, by doing this. It, adenosine can also help in a diagnostic way, right? Um, if you stop the ventricular, you can see, like here, you can't see that underlying flutter because it's like a, um, you know, like a two to one conduction that you can't see. But if you stop the ventricular, if you stop the communication to through the AV node and there's no QRSs, you can pull up that uh, flutter wave very nicely um, and you can identify what's going on. And again, this didn't hurt the patient. Um, it's gonna go right back into atrial flutter. Um, 
adenosine is not going to work for atrial flutter. But uh, yeah, that's the big goal. And then with atrial flutter in general, not much we can do pre-hospital, right? If they are stable and not hypotensive and they don't need electricity, um, varying protocols, but I don't know if too many agencies that have beta blockers, diltiazam, any of that other stuff. Um, if you do, great, follow your protocols. But in general, kind of just supportive care and um, very close monitoring for decompensation, making sure you don't need to do electricity. All right, what if instead um, he uh, actually tells you he's lightheaded and short of breath, he does have a slightly increased work of breathing and a slightly elevated respiratory rate. And he actually tells you that instead of at a bachelor party over the weekend, he had an ACL repair two days ago. His heart rate's like 170 and uh, instead of 210, and he's breathing in like 30 times a minute. Thinking PE, you guys are so good. Can't fool you. What is this rhythm, though? If you do some. Also a valid question. Uh, clarifying substance use is a valid question. What is this EKG show? Say so atrial flutter, SVT, what's going on here? Sinus stack, yeah, exactly. P wave before every QRS, QRS after every P. Um, could it maybe be a hidden flutter thing that you're not seeing possibly, but pretty much this is sinus stack. So you guys um, already nailed it. So this patient has uh, the whole setup was for pulmonary embolism. The question is, what do you do for this? So he's tachycardic because he has a pulmonary embolism. Besides driving fast, what are you going to do? Do you try to slow him down? Do you try vagal maneuvers, adenosine? Are you going to shock him? What are you going to do? O2, yep. Fluids, exactly. Yeah, I mean, it's really just supportive care, right? Um, you can do the fluids, just keep a close eye on his oxygenation. Um, flu fluids will help the preload though, um, I agree. And cardioverting this patient would not be a good thing, right? Um, especially if sinus tachycardia. I mean, who hasn't shocked sinus tachycardia? Let's be honest, at least once or twice. But in general, uh, shocking sinus tachycardia um, in a patient with PE, especially if it's a big PE, has a large burden, um, would certainly not lead to a good outcome. Oxygen is great, fluids, but keeping a close eye on his oxygen, making sure that his lungs don't start to fill up with fluids, um, and then basically um, driving fast. All right, any questions on anything we've covered? Option of CPAP, BPAP, BiPAP. Yeah, absolutely. Um, if As long as he doesn't have contraindications, right? So if he's not hypotensive um, or not altered, um, certainly can consider CPAP and BiPAP. Um, the data on PE, yeah, but you can try it. You can certainly try it if they're, they have a lot of um, respiratory distress. What is pacing and, or how is it done? Um, do you mean transcutaneous pacing? Yeah, so um, yeah, I can go back to that. Uh, I, I'm not gonna try to go back to my slides. So what we're talking about is, um, you know, putting pads on and using electricity to basically uh, beat someone's heart for them. Um, if it's beating too slow, um, having the um, electricity uh, externally to go through the heart and help it uh, contract basically. Um, and it is certainly not uncomfortable. Um, not not uncomfortable. Uh, it's uncomfortable. It's painful is what I'm trying to say. Uh, but it is uh, something that is indicated if somebody's heart rate is too slow and they are not maintaining a blood pressure. Yeah, exactly. Like an emergency pacemaker through stickers on the heart, on the chest, um, not internally. Exactly. In the hospital, we can do um, temporary pacemakers that we actually put through vessels to get to the heart, but um, certainly in the 
pre-hospital realm um, stickers on the heart is on the chest is about as good as we get. Anything else? It's a valid question. Thank you, Sandy. Most remote email care mechanisms to disable. Ooh, I would hope so, but I actually don't know the answer to that. Do some people want to weigh in on that? Do you all have magnets? So while people are answering, magnets, what they basically do, for those who don't know, is um, if you have an implanted ICD or a um, defibrillator, right? And these are folks who tend to have uh, a tendency to go into ventricular tachycardia and they have internal wires that will detect that and shock them out of it. If you put a magnet over the ICD, it basically turns it off. Um, and um, if that would be used if they, for example, are being inappropriately shocked. So the ICD is thinking that there's ventricular tachycardia but it's not, and it's shocking the patient. Um, yeah, and it may take a few or not work at all. Um, and then the other um, indication is for a pacemaker. So what uh, putting a magnet over a pacemaker does is reset it back to its standard settings. And that's kind of dependent on what the pacemaker is. But if, for example, someone's paced at 80, um, you can kind of reset it back to 60 by putting the magnet um, on the chest. Um, it sounds like most... At least Stephanie's agency does not. Um, Becky, I don't know if you guys have it or not. The ER does, yeah. So yeah, the ERs always do um, or should, uh, but I don't know if agencies do. It's a good question, Blake. And then, you know, I know we have various levels of responders here. So a little bit like um, something I wanted to emphasize is if you're a BLS, oh, <laughs> yes. So and, uh, Dr. Wright put in the comments, if the ACD is firing, don't turn it off unless you know for sure. It shouldn't be. Yes, absolutely. Um, thank you for pointing that out. Um, and then the, and a lot of the time, actually, I don't, the patients that I've had come in with inappropriate shocks, um, the transporting agency appropriately did not um, turn it off um, because obviously it's hard to determine that in the pre-hospital realm. And then will the variable rate pacemaker reset with magnets? Um, I would assume so, but I don't know exactly, Chase. Uh, but I think most, if not all, are set that if a magnet goes over it, it resets to the base settings. But I don't, I don't know for sure. Don't quote me on that. Chapter two doesn't allow the magnet. Good to know. And then one thing I did want to highlight is if you're a BLS only agency, right? Or if um, you're uh, just BLS on call and you don't have ALS that day, what is you guys' threshold for like rendezvousing with ALS, right? What what are you thinking about, right? Like what, what vital signs are you thinking about calling for help? If you're EMT IV and you can start fluids, great. But what, what do you guys thinking. I want my BLS agencies or my BLS providers to kind of put some thoughts in the chat. Granted, that depends on if you have ability to access. I want help as soon as I can get it. I like that. BLS and drive. Yeah, it kind of depends, right? Certainly. I would say, you know, I don't know if I have specific cutoffs, right? But if there are profound vital sign abnormalities and there, you know, hypotension, tachycardia, and I'm not talking about like 110 sinus tachycardia, right? Um, obviously, you're not going to have a 12 lead. You're not going to be able to interpret. I mean, you may know, but within the scope, you're not going to be able to interpret uh, rhythm. Um, if they're diaphoretic, yeah, but I like that, putting a helicopter in standby. Um, it certainly depends on your system or what resources you have, but the moral of the story is if you're uncomfortable, do not be afraid to ask for help, right? If they're hypotensive, anything is off. Um, if there's help around, call, call them, right? Yeah, and consider the deterioration, exactly. So the patient who has VTAC, but I guess, you know, we're not calling it VTAC, has a heart rate of 190, but a blood pressure of 120, that's probably some pretty high crump potential, right? So this is not somebody that you would transport 
BLS with an EMTIV. This is, uh, unless you had to, certainly if you had to, um, that's a different matter. But if you have availability to call an ALS agency to meet you halfway there, um, I would certainly consider that because that patient is going to deteriorate most likely. Good point, Blake. Anything else? These are awesome points, guys. Thank you. While you're thinking about additional comments, um, we are putting together, uh, we're building the schedule for next year's um, series of these talks. And so we do want to hear from you, um, whether email, whether in the chat, whether whatever way you're comfortable of giving us feedback, we want to know. Um, that's my email address and Dr. Wright's email address. Uh, tell us what you liked. Tell us what you didn't like. Tell us about topics that you want to hear about, um, certainly you know specific to um, rural practice. Um, Burns. Okay. Thank you. Um, funny enough, I have a burn talk ready to go. Um, OB. Yeah, that's, uh-huh. We actually have plans for that already. So stay tuned. Um, that is coming sooner than 2024. Yeah. And so just think about it. If you think anything, if you have a case that's weird and you're like, listen, I want, I feel like this is a good learning opportunity. Um, yeah. Peds is always terrifying. Um, send it our way. Awesome. So Peds DKA. I will make sure to save this chat. Thank you guys. Um, and then, you know, tell us something you don't like too. If you have feedback on how to make it better, like make us talk less or make us talk more, um, put it in the chat for us. Um, the other thing is for those of you guys who are able to join us on uh, Saturday in a couple of days um, for our Skills of Palooza, thank you so much you guys for signing up. Um, you got an email yesterday or sometime this week, uh, but basically it's Saturday at 9 a.m. Please be on time. It's gonna be in Ray, Colorado. Um, uh, we will feed you, you get free lunch out of it. So that's, you know, the most important thing. And, uh, as with any educational activity, uh, be ready to buy in and engage. Um, it doesn't really work unless everybody's engaged and playing along. I will have this up for questions or excuse me for CE and I will stay and hang out. Yes. At the baseball field. Exactly. And see if you guys have any questions in the meantime.